And uh, our next speaker is Professor Tanya Munro, who's going to talk to us about harnessing light on the nanoscale. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honour to be here. I'd like to start by thanking not only my mentors throughout the years, some are here, some are not here, but to thank you all, my supporters, my nominator. And as you'll see as I go through my talk today, this is the work of a fantastic team, both at the University of Adelaide, but also teams of collaborating scientists throughout the world. And I'd like to acknowledge them up front in case I forget as I go. Um, so harnessing light at the nanoscale. A lot of this work has happened within the relatively recently formed Institute for Photonics and Advanced Sensing, and you can see there an image of our new building which has just reached full height and construction and we're due to move in in February next year. We, have, we bring together 150 physicists, chemists and biologists, and the philosophy is very simple. Um, and in fact, some early conversations with Bob Vincent, who's here in the audience, um, were really pivotal in some of our thinking. But when you think about it, experimental physics of any kind is really about pushing the limits of measurement. And if we look at the impact that's had in other areas of science, whether it be, you know, X-ray crystallography and the structure of proteins or whatever it be, or more recent developments, often the things that people need to measure come almost as serendipitous discoveries from experimental physics. So what we're trying to do within our institute is to have those synergies happen at an early stage so that we experimental physicists can work with biologists, chemists and people in other fields of science and with industry to create these new tools for measurement. And I'm going to talk about some of the work that goes on within IPAS to do that. And in order to set the scene, I'm going to give you a tour of a couple of my labs where we create new optical materials and have new ways of processing optical materials that allow us to start to harness light at the nanoscale. One of the areas where we bring together essentially material science and glass chemistry is shown here, where we make new types of glass. This is not in any way nanoscale. These are bulk pieces of glass of a few hundred grams where we're striving to create properties in materials that aren't accessible with glasses that you can buy off the shelf. Some of the things we're interested in are, for example, glasses that can trans transmit mid-infrared wavelengths, um, other, other wavelengths that are not available in conventional materials. What we do when we've made these glasses then is we develop techniques for structuring them and patterning them. And we're doing this in order to be able to control the way light travels through them. Just as Joss was describing, our game is moulding the flow of light. And our particular technique, which we've pioneered over the years, is one called based on glass extrusion, where we basically take the glass, heat it, make it soft, and squeeze it through a die to introduce a complex structure which is still on the macroscopic scale. These uh, structures are of order of millimetres. Then we take this structure and we stretch it down on an optical fibre drawing tower to create a structure that is on micro or nano scale. We can make features in these optical fibres that range from 10 nanometres to 20, 30 microns. That's the toolbox we have for making structure. And once you've done that, these optical fibres can become platforms for creating new biological, chemical, radiation and other forms of sensors and new types of lasers. And what I'm going to concentrate on today is showing you some of the new insights that we've had from being able to access material properties at the nanoscale. Because I've been especially fortunate in this event this week to have a chance that I don't think anyone else has, I'm extremely blessed to have two talks. <laughs> I'm going to spend my pausey medal talk tomorrow talking more about some of the applications of this technology, particularly some of the sensors that we're developing, and today a little bit more about the fundamental science and the nanotechnology. I'd like to start by flagging some collaborative work done with Professor Steve Prower's group and, um, at the University of Melbourne and my team in Adelaide, which I think encapsulates the spirit of what we do. As I said, we are glass experts creating new glass materials in our labs. And one thing that's intrigued me for quite some time is there are many families of nanoparticles which have really rich and powerful and interesting properties. But often, to access the properties of these nanoparticles, we need to nanomanipulate them. We need to find them in these big, complex, expensive microscope systems and manipulate them to be where we want them to be in order for them to work. 
So what we've done in partnership is created a new approach to harnessing the power of nanoparticles by embedding them within glass. And we've shown for the first time that in this particular case, diamond nanoparticles, which have some very rich and intriguing properties, not least of which the capacity to generate single photons one at a time, can retain that characteristic when embedded within a glass. And so as you can see in this image on the bottom left, which was on the inside cover of Advanced Materials a few months ago, we created a tellurite glass embedded with diamond nanoparticles that could still have single photon emission characteristics. So what we have now is a material which can be on the bulk scale, macroscopic micro nanoscale, whatever you choose to do with it, but it has embedded it within it this nanoscale structure. Moving on the theme of nanoscale structure, the capacity to take these materials and manipulate them in new ways allows us to do some very clever things with moulding the flow of light. What I've shown here are six images of perhaps some of the more weird and wonderful ways of moulding the flow of light, each of which could be a separate talk here. I'll draw your attention to the top left one here. In this case, this is a 20 nanometre hole that extends over about 10 metres of optical fibre. I'll talk in a moment why we do this, but essentially, in fact, if I put the cursor over, you may see it better. Um, essentially, what we're doing here is we're introducing ways where we can confine light at scales much smaller than the wavelength of light, allowing it to, to do new things. And some of these other types of structures allow us to essentially pattern materials to control light. So I'm going to go into just a couple of examples, and this is my only slide with an equation on it. But I think it captures the essence of one of the messages I have, which is if we can create an interface within a structure, that interface might be between glass and air or between two different materials. If you go right back to Maxwell's equations, you can show that you can localise light on an interface. And that localization of light in an interface is not something new. It's something that comes out of these well-loved equations we've had for hundreds of years. However, our ability to structure materials below the scale of the wavelength of light is relatively new. And now that we can do that, we can start to do things like confine light on a surface, as shown here, or in this image here. And if we can confine light on a surface with a thickness, a layer thickness of, say, 5 to 10 nanometers, we can controllably interact it with something else that we put on a surface. So we might, for example, functionalize a surface with antibodies, or some particular biology we wish to interrogate, and we can then interrogate it really efficiently by having a controlled nanoscale structured light profile. Or, in this fibre that I showed you before, by having light confined within this region here, which is a scale of maybe about one square micron, and then punching a tiny little hole within it, in the centre, we can confine light within that tiny hole because essentially the light that is localised on either interface of the hole doesn't have the space over which it can decay. And so it's trapped. And this now is an ability to pattern light well below the wavelength of light, which you can think of in some ways as beating the diffraction limit. It's not truly beating the diffraction limit because for those who like to think about these things, it's a near field effect, but it allows you to get access to structure and to interrogate materials on much smaller scales. Another really interesting thing that happens, imagine you've got a con very conventional optical fibre. Um, you can think of it as a pipe for light, light bounces around within it. Now imagine you scale it down until it becomes comparable to or smaller than the wavelength of light. The analogy I like to use, particularly when talking to school groups, is it becomes like a rail for light and it can still guide the light but much of the light comes outside it and that's how we can use that type of structure as a sensor and I'll talk more about that tomorrow. But another interesting thing we've discovered is as you make that rail smaller, the light stops being polarised in the plane of the fibre and starts to get polarisation components that are longitudinal to the fibre. It's interesting. It's different. It's new. People in guide away of optics never think about longitudinal polarisation. But what can you do with it? Well, two things you can do with it, one of which is you can now put particles such as here, a little gold nanorod, at the end of a fibre, or a silver, it doesn't matter what, a metallic particle at the end of the fibre, and you can very efficiently excite resonances within that, such as surface plasmon resonances, to detect single molecules. Or, in something quite different, as Joss mentioned, we look at things called optical nonlinear effects, where we use light to control light, and these longitudinal components of the mode, which only exist when you have nanoscale structure, 
allow you to have dramatically enhanced nonlinear effects in these optical fibres, meaning we can use relatively low optical powers to use light to manipulate light. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples in my last few minutes of my talk about how we can actually bring this together to do something useful. So what we do is we take new materials and can introduce nanos nanoparticles into those materials and we can structure materials on the nanoscale. Then if we can combine this with the capacity that's been developed over the last 20 plus years in biotechnology to functionalise surface, surfaces with specific biology, it might be antibodies, it might be any kind of specific biology, we can now make novel diagnostic tools. And as I'll mention tomorrow, we now can make measurements of everything from the flu virus to early stage gastric cancer using a few nanoliter samples because of these nanoscale interaction volumes. Working with chemists, we can now develop designer fluorophores on our surfaces to allow these structures to interact with specific chemicals of interest. And some of the work here is being used to probe nutrient levels in the root zone of a plant or corrosion on an aircraft. We've de recently demonstrated a proof of concept for a DNA detector that can work in a few nanoliters of liquid by taking something called a molecular beacon, which when a, a single strand of DNA with somewhere between 20 and 40 base pairs comes along and binds, it unquenches the fluorescence and we can make a measurement. And as a last example, within one of our super science projects, we're doing some work on photoswitchable surfaces where, using light, we can regenerate the surface of one of these sensors by changing the information of the chemistry on that surface. So what I hope I've shown you in this, just this little cartoon here is really how the power to take light at the nanoscale and bring it together with all the clever things people do in other fields for controlling and manipulating surfaces is incredibly powerful. I hope that's not up in tea. So finally, um, I hope I've given you some insight into some of the work that's happening now where we can be very creative in coming up with new ways of controlling light and using that to interact light with materials and create new ways of making measurements that I think will have a really big impact across many areas of science. Thank you. <laughs>